is going on, only playbook fans? Impromptu random Sunday afternoon episode because we got the full squad. Dr. Oja is back on his regular shift, so we get to be graced with his presence. Uh, it's the usual crew, me and Shovit. But Shashot, you are back. How are you feeling? Ready to talk football today? Oh, so ready, man. I was working night shifts to, for the last two weeks, and I've, uh, you guys had some uh, people come on the podcast. Some of them I agreed with, some of them I heavily disagreed with. Um, so, yeah. Um, can't wait to talk about more football and do some drafts and see how things pan out. Feel good to be have a uh, show back on the podcast show of it or taking a little bit of spotlight away from you. Dude, no, it's great, man. We missed you. <laughs> what are you talking about? We missed you. We wish you were on there last week because I feel like you would have probably said some stuff like, hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about? You would have given some, you know, uh, your opinions on, on some of the uh, issues that we brought up. But um, no, man, it's good to have you back. Yeah, I'm glad you've been scouting the uh, preseason despite not being on the podcast. So today's episode, really jam-packed. We're going to give the floor to you. You're going to give us basically you know, four or five cream of the crop pieces of advice heading into Fantasy Football 23. A little bit different than what we've done in the past, a little bit more outside the box. And then we're just going to do a mock draft. So we are in a home league, 12-team, half-point PPR. Uh, we've already done draft order. I draft in the seventh spot. Shashot drafts in, or no, I draft in the ninth spot. Shashot drafts in the eighth spot and Shova drafts in the seventh spot. So we are literally right after each other. So we thought it'd be fun to do a mock draft before our draft, which is in what, seven days. So we'll kick it off to Shashot and then we will do a mock draft. Shashot, bring us home with your best keys to winning fantasy football this year. And don't hold out okay. on us or, or give us misdirection thinking that these are oh, no, real no. keys, but uh, just fake keys. No, no, no. These are real. The drafting later may not be real, <laughs> but this is totally real. Okay. 2023 fantasy tips. Um, a lot of you guys are probably not going to agree with some of this stuff, but a lot of you guys will probably uh, not even know about some of this stuff. So uh, pay attention. All right. So number one, each draft is unique. I don't know how many times I have to stress this. Each draft you do is unique. So don't walk into a draft with a blueprint. Oh, I'm going to go two running backs first. Oh, I'm going to go three wide receivers first. That, that, don't do that. Anita Marks, who is a heavily paid ESPN person, just did the ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon. She was the number one overall pick, trying to screw everybody over with, with a CMC shirt, but she ended up drafting JJ. I saw that. But, but she went in there with a the, with the strategy. And I'm like, dude, who's hiring this person? Why is she on TV? This is like... She got she got shocked when Mike Clay drafted Garrett Wilson with his eighth pick. And I was like, damn, solid. Don't tell anybody else, Mike Clay, but now it's on TV, right? So we're screwed. But she was like, Garrett Wilson with the eighth pick. Like, what is this? Like, this is outrageous. I'm like, God, you clearly did not. You have no idea how this works. I am no longer paying attention to any of your picks. So, again, that threw her off. Don't be that guy. Don't be thrown off because you're so ready for a certain blueprint. Oh, this is what's going to happen. This Nothing will ever happen that way, okay? Nothing will ever happen that way. But how the first round goes will dictate how the rest of the draft goes. So you may have an idea, um, but that's going to change short, really quickly, especially if you're a good manager. You will anticipate that stuff, have stuff queued up. So this is all about not going in there with a certain strategy, okay? That being said, um, another one to add to this specific tip is, um, you know, if if you're going with no strategy, uh, it's not really no strategy, but it's more of an open-minded strategy, uh, you have to reach for certain players. You're going to have to reach to get the players you want to get, right? Like Mike Clay had to get Garrett Wilson, and he was like, wait a second, by the time I come back around, I know some of these other guys like Garrett Wilson too, so I got to get them. So again, another example of that is, let's say you're going into the draft, you you see a player like T Higgins and you're like, I don't think I'm ever going to have T Higgins on your team. I remember Shovit said something about that on one of the last podcasts. He, uh, you know, you were like, I'm not really sold on T Higgins. And then Sweetheart was like, here are the reasons T Higgins is good. Um, so one person wants T Higgins, one person doesn't. So if you definitely do not have to, um, if you don't want him, you don't have to get him. You can reach. Don't be afraid of reaching. Reaching is just it's, it means nothing. These are all guesses, right? JJ, Justin Jefferson going number one is just a really, really good guess that he will have the most points. doesn't mean Tyreek Hill won't have 50 more points than him. It could easily happen. So, again, drafting T. Higgins, you don't want him. He's right in front of you. You can grab Calvin Ridley, okay? So, there's a lot of these type of things. Again, this, whole, this, this tip in itself is all about not having a specific strategy going into the draft and understanding that ADP is just a guide and it will ruin you if you think you have to follow this the whole time. That is tip number one. Yeah, let me yeah. jump in there real quick. I totally agree with that. I think 
I think the the problem, like you said, with ADP is everybody thinks like that is just what's right. It's like, I have to take the next best player if I don't know who to take, but that doesn't mean anything. Like you said, it's just an algorithmic based projection, right? Like we just talked about on Sleeper Shisha before we started recording on the home screen Sleeper, when you're drafting, you can't see their 2022 stats without clicking like two extra buttons. So all it does is project what they think is going to happen in 2023. And the rankings are all based on that. So yes, if you have a guy that you know, like Devonte Adams, who's a surefire wide receiver one that they keep projecting as being lower than some of these other guys in the first round, you can absolutely reach. And I think people get too caught up in this or like, Oh, I'm drafting this guy way behind his ADP, blah, blah, blah. But you did the work. If you trust your analysis and what you studied in fantasy football, like you said, I didn't think it was shocking at all that Garrett Wilson went eight. The entire floor was like baffled at the fact that Garrett Wilson went eight overall. And I only had one tip and one tip only today. And it was literally just going to be two words, Garrett Wilson, because we're going to do a draft right now. And you'll see, again, he's going in the third round. (laughs) He's going in the two, three turn, which just makes absolutely no sense to me at all. So I'm with you. I think the approach is always be open-minded because the draft is going to go every which way. That's why it's important to do a bunch of mock drafts because our home league, despite me doing 100 la- drafts, I'm pretty confident when we draft our home league, it's going to go nothing like what our mock drafts go like, right? Because we just have a different level of player base. And when you're doing a mock draft, it's all CPU. Most of the time, it's like, you know, basic drafts and or next best player available. So I totally agree with you. Go in with an open mind and don't be afraid to reach because you and I talk about this all the time. Like you want the players you want for a reason if you truly trust your process. And if they're not on the screen when you're drafting, who the hell cares? Yeah. I mean, it's all boils down to ADP, right? The average draft position. And it's kind of interesting because like what's being settled as the average draft position is what's already there. So if you want to like an advantage over other people, you're going to try to find someone that's like not the right place that they should be. And so reaching for Garrett Wilson absolutely makes sense. But also like this whole thing of just going at using ADP as your only strategy that that like mathematically, like it, it's a self fulfilling prophecy at this point, right? Like you're only using what's already there to kind of make your draft position. So yeah, I'm with you, you know, be and, bold. And I'll add that ADP is something that the average fantasy football player uses, right? So I could, I would probably throw a stat out there. Like 75% of people that play fantasy football are probably oh, more, just like maybe more. more, maybe more that are just going in there and being like, this is what I'm basing all my entire draft off of. I've done no prior research, right? So that's why for the people like us who have done the research, we're at a huge advantage. We'll reach somebody will be like, oh, that's weird. They weren't on the screen, but they have no idea what is actually happening because they're just looking at the screen in front of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that brings me to tip number two. All right. It's the world of analytics, right? This tip is mainly for the analytics. Um, it's psycho- psychological as much as it is any metric. Okay. Let me break that down. So, you know, the elite fantasy players can justify going against analytics and still be comfortable in their decisions. You, you, you must own up to your decisions, man. Like, you have to do this. Otherwise, th- there shouldn't be uh should have, could have done this. I should have drafted this guy. If I would have started this guy and set up this guy, I don't live in that world. It makes me laugh when I hear those talks because you pulled that trigger. You made that decision, right? These decisions will haunt you. So think about this, okay? Do you want to make a decision because you made the best decision possible or are you making a decision because somebody else thought this was the best decision possible? Okay, let me break this down even further. So- if you choose to pick a guy that has scored a touchdown five weeks in a row, right? Sounds great. Look at that. That guy, that guy's doing great fantasy. I want that guy on my team, right? But kind of look at this whole situation and you say, hmm, you know, he's at a good pace. He'll probably, they'll probably find him open, you know, this upcoming week. Yes, but also no, okay? This is the worst way to play fantasy football. And this is what I call the Neanderthal method. This is what someone's, significant other on their same fantasy league is probably gonna do the same method you know they're like oh this guy did great a couple weeks ago like dude you're gonna lose nobody with this method will ever win a championship okay it's too easy it's too easy and that's why everybody will think of doing that and you want to be the person that can do things other people don't do because that's the only way you can win okay so what can you do to make this scenario different right one Look at the cornerbacks he faced. I'm not talking about looking at the defenses he faced because that's also easy. You have to make things harder than they are if you want to be better than the people that are taking it easy. 
So look at the, not the defenses. You can play against the Patriots defense, but realize that the cornerbacks were out, right? Hence, great day from a wide receiver. These things matter. These things matter. And it's baffling to me that people that say they care so much about fantasy, like a lot of my friends, but they, they don't do any of this. None of this matters to them. So you have to break things down deeper to get to the level of the wide receiver. Again, you, if you're talking about a running back, you have to break things down, not just from, oh, what did the previous defense do as far as yards allowed? No, which linebacker was playing, which linebacker was playing what position. All of these matter, and these are all different metrics to bump up your uh, strength and how, how much you believe in that player. So again, I'm saying analytics because we're talking about analytics in the most basic form, right? Like people will be like, oh, well, he faced this defense and they allow 67 yards per rush. I don't care if that defensive tackle is not playing this next game. That that bumps up 15 points right there. So you want to be on top of the basic the premium level analytics that everybody else sees, you can choose to get deeper into all of them. So that's why I'm calling it psycho psychological because you can psych yourself out by going with these numbers that you see on this screen on that. That's why when we were talking about the sleeper thing, not having the, the, um, the last year stats, the year before stats, all of that matters, right? So people that aren't realizing this will probably never click on the player and go look back. We already have a huge advantage. We'll be like, it's just, it's crazy to me. Things like that matter. Okay. So um, that's basically it for that, that pick. Um, some of the things I wrote down, like, you know, air yards, but when people look at uh touchdown rate of a receiver, when, when people look at the same scenario, touchdown every week, that's an insane touchdown rate. Right. But we're not looking at some of the other things like, air yards how hard was it to get that touchdown did they get the touchdown with defenses all over them or did they get a touchdown with a long 80 yard pass because the cornerback fell down like analytics are only only going to be helpful if you know what you're looking for you cannot let the analytics be the reason you're making this decision at the end of the day when you wake up sunday morning and you see you you have to make a decision between two two players right you all we always go through this every sunday and we live with our decisions or we should live with our decisions because at the end of the day, either a computer told you that was a good choice or you make the decision that that is a good choice. And you can always extrapolate on the computer's numbers. And that's what you should do. And that's what I'm saying. This is psychological. This isn't about the analytics. Analytics are a tool. If you, if you choose analytics over anything else, you're not going to make it. Yeah. So if, if JJ is playing Jared Alexander, don't start JJ, right? No, I'm just kidding. That's probably not the best example. Uh, a terrible example. <laughs> no, but in, in terms of quarterback, no. Um, one thing I thought about whenever you say you were saying that is um, the Saints defense. Okay, so like the Saints defense uh, this year has a lot of games out there playing against rookie quarterbacks. Like that could potentially be something that like you can go out and get uh, looking at like the the matchups, right? Like the the QB matchup. They play the Panthers. They play the Buccaneers. They play Texans. They play Colts. You know, all rookie, and they play the Packers. You know, Jordan Love. You don't really know what's going on there. So like. Um, looking outside of like the Saints ADP is probably very, very um, low or high in terms of like where you draft them. Uh, but in terms of matchups, like that could be something that you seek out for because, you know, against rookie quarterbacks, like give me that all day. Yeah, it's just really, again, basic down, dumb it down. It's just thinking outside the box, right? If you're doing what everybody else is doing, your outcome is probably the best it can be is just as good at what, good as what everybody else is doing, right? If you're just, ta like you said, it's a psychological game and it's just ultimately about how much you want it or how bad you want, how much more effort you want to put in. You want to click two extra boxes to look a little bit deeper into the numbers or are you that guy Sunday at 1130 that's just going to go, this guy's projected higher than this guy started him. This guy's projected lower than this guy bench him. Like, it can be that way, and it is for a lot of casual players, but then you sit here and you're like, oh, man, like, you know, it's it's all luck. Like, I barely, you know, I didn't even win, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, you did nothing. You did the most basic thing that anybody can do. They can switch na names and numbers around. Like, that's the most basic thing you can do. So, uh, you know, at the end of the season, there's no reason to, like, whine and moan when all you've done is what basically 90% of fantasy football players do. Right, right. Um, absolutely, man. Like, people say it's luck. The people that don't understand this game – like, you know, just show it. Look at yourself where you are now and what you would have said in the same conversation like four years ago. I remember having these conversations with you. You even, you know, one year you were like, fuck this. I don't even want to play fantasy football because you're like, this is all bullshit. It's all just numbers just come up and you just choose. All right. I lost by 0 0.1 points last season, man. Come listen, on. man. Listen, <laughs> I lost three of my first three picks and I made the playoffs. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Oh, I don't want to hear it. 
I mean, it's. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say like you take luck completely out the door. No, no, no. That, that's my point. That's my point. My point is, it's not about luck. It's about setting yourself up to have the best luck. That's complete facts. I think I'm going to need to quote that and put your face on it with a quote because <laughs> it's not about luck. It's about setting yourself up to have the best luck. That's a great. That's a great quote. I'm not even just saying that. That's fantastic. For sure, it's it's accurate, man. It's accurate. Yeah. I, I use that analogy of. Drafting CMC first, drafting Eckler second, and drafting Chubb third, and I lose all three of them by week five, you still make the playoffs, right? Like, I don't want to hear your point one. I don't want to hear it. Real quick, before you go to the next point, I'm just relaying that to real life football. And I agree with it because that's how I feel about everybody that tells me just getting into the playoffs and then it's a crapshoot. Yes, I agree. It's lucky. But did you set your roster up so that when you're in the playoffs, you have a better chance at being luckier because you have a better roster than the rest of the teams in the playoffs? Yes, that that matters too, it's, right? So it's, it's see, not just about not getting into the dance. No, it really isn't. Um, all right, so um, last one. These these are a lot shorter. Um, those I felt deeply about because I've I've run into you know multiple people over the last month or so that I've had these conversations with them, and I'm like, dude, you're not going to win your league, and they're like, what? <laughs> like, no, but you know you got to open people's eyes. Like you got to go deeper than what you think you're doing. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, number three, tip number three. Uh, people that fill up starting lineup first. Oh my God. Like it, uh, it's so hard to get to these people's heads. The season is multiple weeks long. You're talking about four months of football. We're not talking about four weeks. When was the last time you drafted a lineup and you ended up with that lineup? Sure. I just got extremely lucky two years ago. We didn't even have to change anything and you won the championship that can happen, but I've been doing this shit for over a decade. It has not once happened. It's difficult. It's it's now you're playing against the luck. You, you don't want to do that. Okay. You can easily set your lineup up just as good with your first nine picks as you would with your 16 picks. It's not that complicated. And let me tell you why. Okay. It's not about, drafting the best available player it, it can be it can be in certain situations but that's not the key right so let me give you an example okay you can let's say like david and joku pops up in like the 12th round or 13th round or something like that okay and you don't have a tight end yet okay you can look at it and be like hmm it's time for me to get a tight end this is the best tight end available you can draft him you can also realize that dalton kincaid is going in the 14th 15th round and cole Komet's going in the 14th round and he's going to put up just the same numbers. It, you know, most likely going to put up the same numbers, if not more. There's higher upside. We've seen what Joku can do for many, many years. And I am not going to touch that guy for that exact same reason. There are some changes in that offense. I get it. But, you know, when you're drafting that late, it's about the spiciness of the player. It's no longer about the comfort level. Um, so let me get back to the main point here. And the main point is setting up your lineup first. You don't want to do that, okay, people? You do not want to just fill up your lineup first. Yes, it sounds great, and you're going to have a great week one, week two, maybe week three, maybe week four. But let me tell you from personal experience, you need to have depth. You would not have made the playoffs if you did it. If you draft Nick Chubb and you drafted um, Eckler and you didn't draft uh Jonathan Taylor with your fourth pick. You know, sometimes you have to understand each year comes with a different layout of players you want, right? This year, so many wide receivers. I could give a shit about what players I draft in the first two rounds. I'm not even playing with you. Things you can you can have a solid team without even having good players in the first two rounds. So when you said earlier, Suiko, we're talking about kicker, you lose a year and then you got to draft the kicker first. I'm like, this year, you could draft the kicker first and you could probably still have a solid ass team because there's just so much room. So understand, do not just start there and start setting up your lineup and then having a weak depth because the people that are going to make it to the finals and win the championships are going to be the players that suffer the same injuries you suffer, but they have another player that can drop 20 points that week while you are scrambling all over the place for eight points, right? So depth matters. I know we're all about immediate gratification and yes, let me get the points now, but this is a long journey, okay? It's a long journey and you have to have a solid core in order to do that. Yeah. If you're not waiting till week, I mean, sorry, uh, draft uh, like around 12 before drafting a kicker or a defense, like what are you doing, right? <laughs> like you're just, it's just because you want to fill up that defensive special team spot with like the seven, uh, 49ers defense, um, I don't know, in the ninth round, like don't do that. Just wait, just but, wait. But here's here's like the, um, not not against that point, It's it's a valid point. But if you've done your research and you realize Saints defense, right? They play nobody this year. Let's say, for example, they play nobody. And you're like, dude, I cannot risk not having the Saints defense. I might have to draft them two rounds earlier. Do it. 
but own up to it. Have a reason when people hound you for draft to pick, like Riaz drafts two defenses that are the top two defenses because he doesn't want to do the homework. He doesn't care about what, what who they play. It's just easy. Does he win because of those decisions? Absolutely not. Like you have to look at what's happening and what your decisions are. Is he going to do that same thing again? Probably. So, you know, just, it is what it is. No, I, I think so. I, I've done that. I'm definitely guilty of wanting to fill out my roster before I go to depth. But I think for me, it's not as simple as I just want to make sure my rosters, my starting lineup is set before I go to my bench. It's all about, like you said, it's just the flow of the draft. Every draft is going to be different, right? So if I'm in a situation where I have the opportunity, I've got two running backs, two receivers, right? And I'm in a situation where I can continue to get another receiver or another running back, or I'm at a turn where there's a quarterback or a tight end there that between that last quarterback and tight end and the next quarterback and tight end in my personal rankings, I feel like there's a massive drop-off compared to like three or four more running backs, three or four more receivers left that I can risk to wait on. Then it's just about what I feel like in my draft makes sense. But the second part of that is 100% what I agree with. If you're going to do something like that, own up to it. Hey, I have Saquon Barkley and Tony Pollard as my two running backs. Unless one of them die or are injured, I'm never starting somebody else over those guys. So yes, if I have the opportunity to get Rashad White or I can get you know Justin Herbert because, because I need a quarterback and I'm like, you know what? Rashad White's there, but after Herbert, I feel like there's a huge drop-off with the Lawrence and the Watson bunch. I'm going to get Herbert. And again, like I said, I'm going to own up to it because I feel like the running backs I have in my room right now, I will never not start them unless they get hurt or, you know, unless they're in a bye week So like you said, it's all about just owning up to it because you have to trust your own process. And I think that's ultimately what you're getting at is if you have a process and you stick to it and people give you shit, tell them why you did it. Yeah, agreed. Um, all right, last thing. Okay, I know it's point four, but I'm going to combine point four and five. Um, Point four is, uh, here's the factual uh, numerical evidence, okay? Um, So only 4% of the top 15 seasons come from players 28 years or or older, okay? In the running back position. They're running backs. Again, I don't care about any of these players. I might just draft kickers, two kickers in the first two picks here, just to prove a point. Just to prove a point. These guys... There are so many players in the NFL with so many roles that are so much bigger than the roles they've been provided before. A lot of these, for example, okay, Eckler's going number one. He's probably the only person. I've stood by this man like before he was even a thing. And for a legit reason, that the the, the numbers prove his skill set. And my eye test has not failed. He's the best running back I have seen in the last three years, period. CMC comes by, CMC goes. I, I don't want to deal with that hesitancy of this and that. And now CMC's in a freaking Mike Sanhan offense, bro. Like, and do again, I'm, I'm diverting, but CMC is not going to do as well as people think he is. And I feel so bad for the people that are stuck having to draft him because his backup dude, anytime he's here, anytime Mitchell's not injured, CMC gets like 10 fantasy points. Okay. This is a real life scenario. I'm telling you guys, and he's healthy. He's healthy. They're going to use multiple running backs. Mike's, uh, um, Kyle Shanahan's not going to just change something because, you know, this one in a lifetime player is here. He's going to go with his method. He's always gone with his method. It's going to be like 15 touches for for uh, CMC on a good day. So, anyways, that's just a side note. CMC talk. But um, Eckler's 28. Aaron Jones 28. Alvin Kamara's 28. James Connors 28. Dalvin Cook's 28. Jamal Williams 28. Zeke's 28. Fournette's 28. Those are names nobody wants on their team right now. Or, you know, Aaron Jones is probably like a name that you may have to get at some point if if the situation follows. But I ain't going to any draft targeting Aaron Jones. The only person I would even want on my team here is Eckler. And that's because, you know, that's that 4%. Do the math, right? There's always going to be that outlier and this and that. But do not get hung up. People use running backs. People throw away running backs. People get new running backs. So if you have the ability to have a good one, um, keep him. But other than that, you just have to draft like five or six of them and just see how things go. Yeah, that's the that's the biggest variable in fantasy football every year is the running back position. Like, yeah, I, I wanted to do this last night and then I think I fell asleep, but I was going to go back and look at drafts and I wanted to see Preble's actual team that he drafted last year on draft day versus what it was when he won the league in the final week. And I wanted to go back and kind of do that with every team just to see how different the roster is or lack thereof, right? Did they just get incredibly lucky with injuries or not? But typically what we see is the especially the running backs that you have on your roster week one, like 
half of that, half of those running backs are either hurt out for season. They suck. Like somebody's overtaking them as a starter. They're in a timeshare where they're no longer the guy. It happens. So like you said, there's like, to me, there's four or five, maybe six running backs at the very, very front that I would view like three down running backs, true workhorses. They're going to catch the ball as well as run the ball 300 plus times. And they're going to touch the ball. After that drop off, like you said, it becomes very Aaron Jonesy. And I'm just like, oh God, I'm in a situation where I don't love this at all. Like, what am I doing? So it, it's it's tricky with all the mock drafts I've done to show, like, uh, it, like you said, you're trying to go into a draft with multiple strategies or an open mind, right? No strategy, multiple strategies, whatever, but just not one strategy. And so I'm like, I'm going to draft two receivers this time. I'm going to draft two running backs this time. I'm going to go one and one. I'm going to go quarterback. I'm going to go tight end and see how it all shakes out. And personally, what I have found is if you're not leaving the first two rounds with at least one of the good running backs, it becomes incredibly difficult. And that's not to say that you still can't have a successful season. It's just about playing the waiver wire, right? But it there is a huge drop off. Like you talked about, Aaron Jones is like that little teeter right where I get to the draft part of the draft where I'm like, God, I loved everybody before Jones. And I don't really like everybody else before Jones in that spot. So, you know, I totally, I, I agree with you for sure. This, this is exactly why I like having the lower picks, not this middle of the round crap, but I, this is why I like having the 12th pick or the 11th pick or the 10th pick, because I can make that decision of getting three wide receivers right off the bat. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I'll, it's I'll do in it. your hands. It's in your hands. You're controlling. I get to pick up who I want to pick up from free agency. Then, then, yep. And a lot of people will pick the easy ones in the beginning. You wait till week seven, week eight, when things really matter. And then all of a sudden Zeke is now the starting running back for Bill Belichick. And you're just like, okay, well, let me just add that to my roster. Yeah. Running backs, man. The the biggest very vari- variable probably in all of fantasy football. Anything else to show? That's it, man. These are just really, really important points. I feel like we just haven't talked about enough in, in our um, three years of podcasting. And I feel like I just walk by like average Joes and they just have no concept of any of this stuff. And I'm like, if you want to do better in fantasy, listen to this episode. Yeah. I mean, it's just about the like the amount of time and dedication you put into it. It's almost like a direct correlation of what you're going to get out of it, right? Everybody that plays fantasy football is just either like the common folk are just like pushed into it because they work somewhere and someone's like, hey, you want to join a league? Sure. Yeah, I want to. This is a way for me to fit in at my new job and meet new people, right? But what they do is exactly what like 90% of fantasy football players do. They just set their lineup. They just look at projections. They just do that. All it takes is like one extra step, maybe 10 extra minutes, 15 extra minutes, just to be a little bit better than everybody else. And sometimes that's that's the difference in the edge of just being a normal dude or, hey, I'm in a $50 league and I have a chance to just win free money because half the people in this league stop giving a shit. Like, Dude. Is there an easier way to make money when half, like, tell me another money-making scenario when the people that put in money into something just stop caring halfway through. And you're like, wow, half of the people just don't care about this money pot anymore. So now the probability of me winning it is like 50% up. Like, it, right. it's, it's just math. If you care about money and if you care about winning, like, these are some of the easiest ways to make money, honestly. Dude, you're so right. And you say 15 minutes, like, what about losing sleep, staying up until 3 a.m. drafting your player? nobody's got a chance i'm talking about my other, my leagues where i play with my med school friends are like how do you win every year bro listen to episode blank on whatever i just said that's how you win yeah yeah no, i three think- m's waiver wire pickups oh man without putting in it, the waivers uh, the night before so you can actually ha- like just pick whoever and no one else picked up yeah those are crucial those are absolutely crucial yeah, you got to be the ones. I think that's the running theme of our uh, fantasy football league. So um, those are great tips to show. We certainly, certainly appreciate that. I had an awesome time. I'm Sweetheart. That's Shovit. That is Shoshot. We are the only playbook. If you enjoy our content, like, subscribe, throw a comment into the channel. We love interacting with you guys. Uh, again, we will be back next week. Season starts in about a week and a half to two weeks. So more content is coming your way. Again, Sweetheart, Shoshot, Shovit. We're the only playbook. See you guys later.